people are already on the right track. But it's like your courage and your discipline. There's a thing in history where the greater the art, the greater the danger surrounding that art. So sometimes you want to use the pressure of your times, you know what I mean, to let it generate the diamonds that are trying to form you. Roy, Bella Fleck and the Flecktones. I hear the band and I am blown away by seeing you perform on the drum guitar, playing and sounding like a, this incredible independent drummer driving this band from this electronic device that is authentic in it, the purity of how you're playing it. Mm -hmm. From a drummer standpoint, it is creative, it was exciting, and I just said, who the heck is this guy? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I thank you so much, Roy, for being here and being a wow, part of the session. Well, sessions. man, it's good to be here. The fact that uh, you're able to try some ideas and make them happen, yeah. sort of maybe add something to the lineage, that's what I was trying to do. And so I'm just glad to be here because I just feel like this whole project, I just heard you guys' yeah. presentation, you know, the sessions yesterday, I took three, four pages of notes, <laughs> you know what I mean? And I've been watching it since that book came out. Sticks and Skins. Sticks, Sticks and Skins. And skins. Yeah, yeah. Just to see this thing evolve is really inspiring. And if I can be somehow a part of that, you know, continuing, I'm just You happy to are, be here. you are, and at a very intense pace. I mean, your creativity and your brilliance and your, and I, I use this word infrequently, your genius, because you really have something that you've tapped into as a musician, as an inventor, as a composer, that really is a whole different thing. But I gotta go back. The beginning of your family, the Wooten family, where did, where did it start for your music and your family and within you? For some reason, everyone in, in my family, all the brothers, we all love music and all wanted to play music mm -hmm. and all sort of picked our lanes in music too. The Wooten brothers was, I'm the second to the oldest. My oldest brother is Reggie Wooten, who they call the teacher. Yeah. He just teaches, man. He's just always known how to teach. <laughs> he taught Victor <laughs> how to play bass. He taught my brother Joseph to play keyboards. Then there was my brother Rudy, who was in the middle, mm -hmm. played saxophones. And what, for whatever reason, Rudy always gravitated towards the wind instrument, the tonette, the this, that. He just could play wind instruments. Yeah. And then I played drums. I started off beating on boxes, just like the rhythm, you know. I made drums out of boxes <laughs> and just it went from there. And then Reg was good with strings, guitar, you know. And so when it was just us three, me, Reggie, and Rudy, uh, three years later, Joseph comes and mm -hmm. Reg just teaches him keyboards. Three years later, Vic comes and we need a bass player. <laughs> so we sort of gave him the bass. He didn't really have a choice. And we were just like, man, we have a bass player, we have a band. And we just always hoped that the bass would fit with Vic. And we said, well, look at his hands. His hands look like a bass player. And so anyway, so many years later, it was a good fit. For and Vic it worked, there. yeah. And it really worked. But, you know, just all along the way, everyone found their strides. Yeah. And the key is that behind a young person achieving something, there's going to be some kind of mentor or support system, and our parents were that for us. They allowed us to make noise in the garage, to invite all the musicians to come over to our house, because they knew where we were. We were out running the streets and kind of things. Yeah. We were young, winning Battle of the Bands contests really early. So at a very early age, we started playing clubs. Mm -hmm. So Vic was... Two years old, where Red started having him play along with us. There's films of us playing with Vic, and we're out in the yard doing a concert. And Vic's not playing the bass yet, but he's on a Mickey Mouse guitar, just <laughs> in there, in there with us. When Vic turned three, Red started showing him where the notes were on a four string guitar that he took the strings off and made it into a bass. So by the time Vic was six, seven, it's when we're getting ready to tour with Curtis Mayfield. <laughs> you know, we're going on a national tour with Curtis Mayfield yeah. opening. You know, so we're learning a lot there. I mean, we learned a lot because that tour folded early. And when we were leaving, you know, we had to leave kind of in a hurry before the second show. Somebody said, you need to, you know, told my parents, you're going to have to leave. The kids need to get on because there's not going to be a second show. There was issues happening. People weren't getting paid. <laughs> oh we were on the way out. Gosh. We saw them in the, with the promoter on the way out. Musicians were dejected, telling us kids, you need to get out of the music business now while you're young. <laughs> and we were just like, man, they don't know. We're not, we're not going anywhere, you know, that kind of thing, you know. So there's a lot of experience, but Vic was like seven, hmm. you know. It's a lot of experience. I'm, and what I'm saying is that our parents allowed us 
to play clubs and stuff when we were too young to get in the clubs. And so the older I get, the more I realize the importance. When I see kids, you know, taking classical lessons or even like I'm teaching young drummers mm -hmm. and the parents are allowing that to happen, yeah. you know, that just, beautiful. it means a lot for someone to see something in you, you know, and let you achieve past where you're allowed to be, you know. The vision of your parents to yeah. be able to fuel yeah. that, whatever you had that was so special, they saw that. Yeah. And they really fuel that. Yeah. And here you are now continuing. So what happened from that point? Did you start playing with more with different bands or you stayed as a family performer? Well, we grew up, we were a band for many years. And man, we played with so many people, just as the Wooten brothers. Right. Since, you know, we got a bunch of posters where Victor's the eight year old bass ace. You know what I mean? <laughs> Vic's, you know, the, the secret, you know, he's ace. the bass ace. <laughs> Vic would play the bass like an upright bass. And, you know, people wouldn't expect him to be able to play. So, you know, they think he's playing with a tape recorder. So we have to give him a solo, <laughs> that kind of thing. So, but along the way, we played with so many people, man. Mongo Santa Maria, we'd open for him. We opened for The Temptations. We opened for War. You know, I remember seeing War play that Slipping in the Darkness group. Yeah. His left hand was ballet, man. I'm like, who would think of playing a groove like that, man? But we just opened for so many people, got so much experience. And how'd man. you get those gigs? We were living at that time in Virginia. In some kind of way, we were just known when they would get someone coming through town I forget who the booking agents, agent was at the time. There was a female, I think, that was sort of our contact with a lot of those shows. And just all these shows would come and we would open the show, you know, and it would always be a good review, too. You know, you know, we'd always get a good review. But it just kind of we were in that, you know, in that groove where we got so a chance did, to open Did you all, people. you know, start learning your, each of your instruments with other teachers or did you stay within the family learning? That's that? actually a good question because we were self-taught, so we already knew how to play, right? Right. I already knew how to play the drums, but in school we learned how to read and stuff. Mm. But one of the keys was when we were really young, I think Vic might have been even five, when we were recording and we were just getting with the Curtis Mayfield group there. Uh, Curtis had started Maytom Record and they heard about us. So we were working on our record and we remember this because we were always the musical family and the Jackson Five was the singing dancing family. <laughs> and there was always this little competition going on. Like we would be recording. They said, we need to use this Celeste because we know that they're going to be using it. We want to get to it. And there was always this little That's thing going interesting. on. You know, we're recording. And when we were recording one time, we saw them uh, doing some of the music for this record they were working on. And we saw the musicians not understand something. And the drummer, I think his name was Nao, he said, okay, hold on, hold on. And he just got a piece of paper like you got. He wrote, tore it up, he passed out about four pieces of paper, and then they all got together and played it. And that made reading music so cool. We were like, <laughs> We need to learn to read music. See, we already knew how to play. Yeah. So we may have gone the past where well, maybe we don't need to learn to read music. Yeah. But when he did that, it was like, whoa, we need to learn to read music. So it's kind of like we went back to school where we were already learning with a renewed vigor to understand this art nice. form as cool as what we saw in the studio, nice. right? So in school, we already knew how to play, but we started taking lessons and stuff. Reg was in theory class. You know, he would just shoot through theory. He just understood theory. I started taking private lessons when I was in maybe ninth, tenth grade Who in was Virginia. That with? Win Winfrey, <laughs> a guy named he's a winner, man. You know what I mean? Me, Billy Drummond, studied with him. Really? Um, and when I went there, I was in search of how, how Buddy Rich and them were doing what they were doing, yeah. the rudiments. Yeah. I was looking at how do you move these stickings around. Yeah. And I was just trying to learn all of them rudiments, man. And I remember when Winfrey. So that's the open mind. Mm -hmm. You already know how to play the drums. I'm not going there to learn to play the drum set. I'm learning how to expand my understanding of what I can execute on this instrument. And sure enough, man, when Winfrey gave me this book, Charles Wilcox and 16 Swing Solos. And it just showed me all of them rules. I remember to this day, the paradiddle diddle is just such a magical <laughs> rudiment. You can just do so much with Absolutely. that thing. Absolutely. Right, left, right, right, left, left. Those yes. six notes. <laughs> that thing just starts taking off, yeah. right? 
And so from there, I, we went into Charles Wilcox and seeing how you put all of this stuff together. It was so slick. And so when I was studying that book right there, man, I said, man, this is some slick stuff in yeah, this yeah. book, man. It sounds like Philly Joe Jones. Well, I just Interesting you say that. It's I know. Kind of, yeah, yeah. I kept saying that. I was like, man, this is some slick stuff. It sounds like yeah, Philly. Yeah. Then, like you said, I learned. Philly was into Wilcox and Big Tim. Now, Charles right. Wilcox, and just so everyone knows as they listen to this, was a rudimental yes. player and teacher. Yes. And wrote these books. Uh, another one is 150 American Souls, I think, by Wilcox. Uh-huh. So several books that he put out. Okay. And I used to go hear Philly Joe Jones in New York. Yes. And I'd see him backstage. Yeah. And he always had a practice pad with a Wilcoxon book open up. And we would play together Wilcoxon stuff before he'd go on stage. You did that? Man. Absolutely. And, I and, need and, an and, autograph. And I, and I was making a million mistakes. <laughs> right. Philly cut through it flawless. Yes. Brilliant, brilliant. Yeah. So that's why you say yeah. how Philly Joe Jones played. Yeah. He pulled a lot of that rudimental ideas out of it. Oh, yes. And applied that in a oh, way. Yes. But that's great that you because, observed that. Yeah, that I, but fantastic. I knew it before I knew it for a fact. Yeah, yeah. I was like, whoa, this idea is just so slick, man. Yeah. Right? And then I also, I read it in Notes and Tones. The book Notes and Tones, Philly Joe Jones mentions Wilcox. I went, I knew it. Yeah, yeah. Right? And then I saw uh, Virgil Donati do a modern drummer interview. Yes. And he said he went to study with Philly, and all Philly talked about was Charles Wilcox. Absolutely. So I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> so I was like, sure enough, there you go, man. And Virgil Donati, who's also a dear friend from Australia, who moved to New York yeah. to be in the scene, hung out with Philly Joe Jones. I didn't know who Virgil was at that time, but we yeah. crossed paths yeah. at that time. Yeah. And Virgil was an avid student of the art form. And it's amazing that you understand that because for people to understand that if they want to study Philly Joe Jones, yes. you got to go through Wilcox. And yeah, because it's, it's kind of like when I studied with Win Winfrey. Yeah. I wanted to see how these drummers are thinking. You yeah. Because yeah. jazz drummers have this touch where they can, they can back off the drums but still press yeah. when they're playing soft. Yeah. And when we played with Curtis Mayfield, that was one of the biggest lessons that we learned. Curtis Mayfield would play soft the whole night. Do, do. Do, 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 zoom, do. And when he would do that, you would just get lifted off your seat. Yeah. So there was a lesson in dynamics as a power, you know what I mean, that we learned. And so I saw with jazz drummers, they were able to hit the drums and lean into the drums without overpowering everything. Yeah. You could still hear the bass player. And I wanted to learn that touch yeah. too with the jazz drummers. But there, it's like for some reason with jazz drummers, it's at a, such a high level where everyone knows how to put together these rudiments, man, to make them swing and to make them swing and sling and they can just go. It's Buddy Rich and all of these guys coming around him yeah. just understand this technology. Yes. And that's yes. what I wanted to learn. And, and so when dropped me right in the middle of that. So you mentioned the flat tones early. Yeah. When I'm looking at the drums a different way, I'm applying all of that. Interesting. Philly Joe Jones, Elvin Jones, yeah. use of the triplet. Yeah. Elvin Jones is a big uh, connect with me. But everything that I'm doing with the flat tones is grounded in fundamentals. Right. It's nothing made up out in the air. And so what was cool, going back to what you said in the very beginning about the flat tones, my goal with the flat tones when I did this, right? I'm experimenting on playing the drums with my fingers, yeah. right? It's just a love of the drums, right? Yeah, yeah. But I want to see, can I use my fingers like drumsticks? And if I can use my fingers like drumsticks, I know that it's going to take me to the melody a different way. When yeah. I start playing melodically, I'm going to think about the melody in a new way. And that was from a quote from Miles Davis, who said, the melody is going to be found again through the rhythms of the drums and the bass. I was like, wow. Sure enough, Miles will say something, and it <laughs> seemed like he's way out, right? But sure enough, man, you got people writing in hip-hop. They're not writing tunes, they're writing beats. Right. You know what I mean? I'm exactly. like, sure enough, he said that, right? Yeah. Then you look at a lot of popular music. The melody's going to be found in the rhythm. The melody is going to be found in the bass and the drums. Right. So many tunes, like Vic, right? He can just play the melodies in the bass. do 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 When you play that, the whole audience is, whoa. <laughs> Do 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 do. Whatever that song is that everybody knows, the bass melody is more important than the, than the other melody. Absolutely. You know, do 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 do. You know what I mean? The melody is like in the bass. I said, sure enough, Miles did hint at that, right? So when we get to the flectones, I'm experimenting on the drums, but 
what's in my mind is we grew up with jazz, right? And we no, actually we grew up with James Brown and Soul right, and listening right. to the radio when the Rolling Stones would be on next to Dave Brubeck, <laughs> next to Sam Cooke, yeah. next to Otis Redding, next to Ray Charles, next to the Animals, <laughs> Creedence Clearwater Revival. I remember waking up here and uh, what? goes up. <laughs> da, 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 da. I'm like, wow, that's kind of like a funky jazz band. You know what I mean? But you Blood, were just sweat, exposed. And Blood, yeah. sweat, and tears. You're just exposed to so many yeah. things, right? We grew up in that time. So by the time we're advancing in music, James Brown, all that, we're advancing in music. So now we're getting into Miles and Elvin and all this jazz stuff. And I'm just trying to apply the seriousness with which these jazz musicians that we're around approach Harmony. Yeah. For them, harmony was just it. We studied with Consuela Lee Moorhead and John Shacklett at Norfolk State University. Now it was college when we were there. And that's Spike Lee's uh, aunt, Consuela, and Spike Lee's dad, Bill Lee, who's the great jazz bassist, yeah. their brother and sister. And they just could tell you stuff about music, theory, and harmony that's just on a, on a level that's you just wouldn't imagine somebody's thinking about harmony like that. Yeah. And right then I knew that I could approach rhythm like that. The way they're looking at harmony and stuff, it's almost like a religion. I could look at drums and rhythm like that. So I was always approaching drums like that. So by the time I'm playing drums and I'm just extracting as much as I can get out of Tony Williams, yeah. I'm, I'm just going from Tony Williams back in a sense because Tony Williams is coming after Elvin and yeah. Max, yeah. Jimmy Cobb, and all of these cats that just laid down this historical approach to yeah. the drum. Uh, Art Blakey, Art all these Blakey guys. The jazz messengers, yeah. But Tony is where he's assimilated something so much that he breaks it out of itself and starts bringing it to rock and roll. Yeah. Fusion. This yeah. is science. Now he's going to fuse this, yeah. right? And so people think that Miles started the fusing thing, but it was Tony. <laughs> and they said, here's Tony, 16 years old, when he's playing with Miles Davis. Kill this. And Miles tells you, we were following <laughs> that kid. You know what I mean? Absolutely. So, so stories are cool, man. I, I, there was a guy in uh, uh, Berkeley that was a teacher, Lenny Nelson, used to tell us about Tony Williams. Yeah. And how Tony Williams is always into this other cat named Bobby Ward from Boston. Oh, yeah. And he said Bobby Ward was like a cross between Buddy Rich and Elvin Jones. You couldn't see his sticks. But he said Tony would always defer to Bobby Ward. Tony, even when he was young, had a really big ego. Yeah. But Tony yeah. Williams, in a modern interview, one of his later interviews said that he didn't think he would have anything to learn from any of the drummers now, with the exception of Bobby Ward. Even at... His later date, he was still giving credit to Bobby Ward. That's powerful. But long story short, with the flat tones, I'm basically trying to apply all of that to where I'm going with my fingers. And it's not a gimmick to me. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm thinking of it the same way you think of technique on the piano. Right. And I'm literally thinking of the drum set and the piano as almost the same instrument. See what I'm saying? Because the piano's got all them sticks in there, hammers. So it just gives you so many different choices in the melody. Absolutely. So I'm thinking of the piano related to the melodic thing that Max Roach is doing to the melody. And what Miles said, that the melody was going to be found again through the rhythm of the drums in the back. I'm, this is what's going on in my mind. <laughs> so by the time we get through with the flectones, I just played drums a long time and I'm just trying some stuff. I'm going to try to play the drums a different way. But when I do, I want to be able to play the way Tony and them played. And Tony starting fusion erupted into Billy Cobble. Yeah. See what I mean? Absolutely. Tony laid this thing down. And a lot of times with my students, man, I try to get them to just look at the intent that Tony Williams is playing them drums. Blah, 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 blah. You know what I mean? He's not just doing a wrist. His whole elbow. Yeah. Kaka, kaka, doo -doo -da, doo -doo -da. It's like the, the emotional, like Bruce Lee said, was that an exhibition? We need some emotional content. You know what I mean? And when you see Tony Williams, man, these guys are playing with so much emotional yeah. content. And Billy has the same thing. You Absolutely. just watch the emotional content with which this man is hitting the drums. Absolutely. The power of intent when you speak about that. That's really important because Billy Cobb puts on the Billy Cobb him retreat that happens, and I've been, been involved with Billy I have that. to get there. You yeah. must come to it because when yeah. Billy starts speaking and playing with the band, it's a rhythm section, yeah. the art of the rhythm section retreat. Yeah. 
when they all start performing and you witness that, yeah. you, you kind of see the history of where Tony, and then you go back to yeah. Max, and you go back, yes. and you begin to feel the yeah. aura of this, which yeah. is unbelievably yeah. exciting. Yes. Unbelievably exciting. Yeah. How did you get to the, the, the point of now designing this drummer tar to, to find the sounds and where you needed to have them under your fingers? Where did yeah. that all come from? Taking the rudiments. Okay, here's the, the thing. When I say I did everything from fundamentals, like I started looking at the rudiments so deep that I could see that the rudiments were still based off like a yin and yang. Yin and being like if you do double strokes. Right. Mama, daddy, mama, daddy, mama, daddy, or either single strokes, right. singles. And between those two combinations, you're going to get everything. Mm. So I learned to, this is my notes from yesterday, <laughs> to, you, to get my bounce with my fingers. Mama, daddy. Right? Now mm. I'm, using, I'm using drum and bugle chord where you bounce and accent on the second bit. My, ma daddy, my, ma daddy, which is a, is a sticking. My, Abs ma daddy, my, ma daddy. And when you do that, it gets that bullet sound. I'm using that same uh, fundamental here when I'm bouncing my fingers. That's the term that we use is a pull out. Yeah. So you're playing the you're playing the second note accent. Yeah. Beautiful. And when you do that, it sounds like bullets yeah. when you get them going. Right. So now yeah. back to paradiddle, paradiddle, paradiddle. So now it's looking like finger exercises on a piano. So I'm applying the same techniques to the drum, and that was my question. I was like, if I can learn to use my fingers the way that I use the sticks, then it's like I can approach the drum set again in a universal way, almost like it's a keyboard right. or a piano. Right. Right. So long story on my journey, I knew that it was going to take me maybe about 10 years to even understand what I was trying to do. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, I'm going to try to find the drums again, but I'm pulling from Tony and Philly Joe, Buddy Rich. I'm pulling from all of that. You know what I mean? Fantastic. Like, I'm trying to bring that to you. you know, like, I'm just like, man, if I could just play Nefertiti here. Right. So by the time I'm doing the flat tones, my whole goal was just not to be looked at like a gimmick. Basically, I said, I'm just going to try to be invisible. It's like <laughs> people just think I'm playing drums. So if I didn't get no news, that was going to be my goal, to just like Shakespeare. You know, who wrote the plays? We don't know. We think it was Shakespeare. I'm just in the background. No news. If I just make no news, then that's good news. You know, because I actually played the drums again. But that was like a beginning step. If I could play the drums again, then I'm actually thinking about the melody, right? So long story short, this is stuff I'm still thinking of because I'm playing the drums like here, and it's like I'm playing a keyboard. But I'm realizing the keyboard is a universal instrument. I'm approaching language because if I say keyboard, the keyboard is either the piano keyboard right. or the typewriter keyboard. Right. They're both language. Right. See what I'm saying? Absolutely. And so it's like, wow, I have, I actually believe what I'm doing is like a whole nother approach to the language keyboard. Right. Right. See what I mean? Like if right. we hit the language keyboard right now, there's no dynamics. You can't play that keyboard musically. But what if you could? Mm -hmm. Then we could do everything that the music has to offer and bring it to language, which language does. Yeah. And we approach it like a universal language. These are things running in my mind. I realize that we're approaching language in a universal sense. And I believe in some of the designs, like you were saying, how do I lay the, like, lay the drums out? It's like, it's almost like phrenology where you're studying like the study of the head and this means that and this means that. It's like if you take your hands to play drums, right? If I'm gonna play bass drum, the thumb is a really good heavy part of the hand to do it on. Right. The next strongest finger might be this finger. You know what I'm like? If you think about playing bass drum on your ring finger, it just, the ring finger just doesn't quite have it. See what I mean? <laughs> the ring finger is more feminine-like, and it floats, and you can put symbols and stuff under your ring finger really nice. See what I'm saying? 
while the bass drum finger, it just wants to hit. This is just a powerful finger. <laughs> it's just a really powerful finger. The thumb is powerful too. The, sn the snare drum finger, for me, this is the next powerful one. And so if you're gonna play snare, it just... So your index finger becomes a snare drum. Yeah, it just really works good. Boom, pop! You know what I mean? You can go hand to hand, and you just start feeling where your fingers are. These are lighter, complementary things. You know what I mean? That stuff floats. So I have pads and stuff, and I have stuff down on the bottom floor, but I also have stuff lifted up. So when I hit the bottom floor, this right here is shafting a top floor. So I have different layers. So if I have a voice right here and a voice right here, when I do this, if I lean back, I can hit them at the same time. This kind of thing. So, so it's you're, a, you're triggering two, two different sounds. at the same time. Interesting. See what I'm saying? Yeah. And this is a different way of thinking of the, the language keyboard too. If I'm hitting things at the same time and stuff. And I'm also stair-stepping I'm also stair stepping, so and this is this is me born on the same day as Art Tatum, <laughs> and some of his the, the way he was getting his secrets is using slides, so top level, bottom level, pop 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 pop, right there I can teach rudiments by just stair stepping the levels. So is this where the Royale came in? Yes, the it's piano the, version of the what? Piano I'm version of yes. this here. So you went from this drum version. Yes. So just explain the piano version. Of what right. This so what's happening with the flat tones? It's like I'm actually seeing wow. I can actually find my way around here. <laughs> so now it's like I want to, what if I could play all the notes? Not just my little kit that's set up in a cluster. <laughs> what if I have access to all the notes? Like the piano, yeah. the chromatic note is laid, it's all there for you. What if I could do that? So I'm already thinking different than the piano because I'm thinking in clusters. You know, the drum set is a battery. You got it where you need it. Yeah. And I'm expanding out a cluster system. Right? So with the piano is basically, now I'm reaching for all the notes. I'm looking for all the notes, because I remember I'm seeing the drum set as a piano, and the piano is a drum set. This is very Yoda, like it's like <laughs> some Miles Davis, like the melody's gonna be found again, right? But in my mind, I'm extending where Max Rose left off, yeah, right? So I'm getting all the notes now. And so with the Royale, it's the first instrument that I did where I started laying it out. And that was the 10 year mark where I said, 10 years, I'll figure out what it is that I'm trying to do. Yeah. And at 10 years, we were building the piano, my first piano, the Royale. I remember the discussion we had many years ago about just the, it was almost like a guitar pick. Yes. That you had, that you went down for a note and went up for a note. And oh, you I played, did tell you that. And you played it in that fashion. Right. Brilliant. So, so watch this, right? This, I'm, this is, these are secrets, right? So I'm realizing, like I can, I can slide off the keys, right? right? So let me use this yeah. for a second. I can slide off the keys. So this is a layer, and this is a layer, right? So I'm realizing like Flamingo, I can go down, I can go that. So I'm getting all of that right. backwards and forth, but I'm getting the bottom too. And then up and down. And this is, this is Tabla on steroid. <laughs> right, I'm thinking Buddy Rich here too. Yeah, See, this is, I'm trying to again. I'm building on where Buddy Rich and them have taken it. Art Tatum, who in my mind is a drummer on the piano, Absolutely. his rhythm. But like Charlie Parker said, I just want to know how to play like Art Tatum's right hand, and that's where bebop comes from. Yeah, which is very interesting, you know. So I'm just I'm like a scientist. I'm just <laughs> I'm just really you watching a guy just nerd out. You know, like a lot of people are upset cuz they just want me to play the drums cuz I know how to do that, you know what I mean? But I'm just nerding out finding this, you know what I mean? So right here when I do this, I do it three levels. 1 2 3. So I can go boom, my bottom levels here. Boom. Right. So when I do that with four, I have my chromatic scale set up in, in rows of four. One, two, three, four, two, two, three, four, three, two, three, four. So I can just go, boom, and I just did a chromatic scale. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like a, boom, ba You know what I mean? It's like that. I'm looking like, I'm, again, what I'm doing is Wilcoxon kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah. Billy Joe kind of stuff. Five stroke roll stuff, but applied king to queens level three and moving into the harmony. I'm moving into the melody now. You know, and then as we go on, all of my keys I have set up where they change the pitch depending on how hard I hit. These are inner secrets I'm saying now, yeah, right? Absolutely. So I have, when I hit the key soft, I get one note. I hit a little bit hard, I get another note. 
hit a little bit hard, I get another note. So it's basically three notes, right. except on the very top, if you look at the MIDI spectrum, you got 127 steps. Steps of Right? Sound. So my very yeah. top note is just 126 to 127. Just when I hit it the hardest, I'll get the very top. So it's basically I got three notes and a top note, which I have as the octave. Mm -hmm. So by dynamics now, I can change the note. So now let's get me to the bebop kind of feeling. Any rhythm that you play has a dynamic slope to it by default. Yeah. So if you set those pitches up, you're going to start popping into this kind of bebop kind of place, right? And so from here, I'm sort of pulling. This is the thing I like about Billy Cobham so much because with Buddy Rich and them and Max and stuff, their solos were kind of circular to me. You know, yeah, vortexes. Yeah. But Billy came out and he was like. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going, wow, he's soloing like, and he's soloing like the, the melodic solos to me. Yeah. And I got a chance to ask Billy about that. And he said, yeah, that's kind of what he was doing. But his solos were a little coming, more linear. Linear. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now, when I set the keys up and the dynamics have changed, it's not just the cool rhythm, but I've got a a harmonic thing that's just popping out, like yeah. you're splashing yeah, yeah. melody. So from my keyboards, immediately symphonic work started popping out. Hmm. You know what I mean? Like I'm playing melodies that I'm just giving to the violins. They're just, they're just popping out, man, you know? So I'm really finding that thing that I was looking for. <laughs> I wish I could show Max Roach what I'm doing. Oh. But Max Roach did come see the Flectones play. Did he really? Yeah. He did come see the Flectones play, and somebody said, man, you have to call Max Roach. It was Vinks, uh, percussion guy, yeah. Vinks. And they said, you have to call Max Roach because he is your biggest fan. I went, wow, man. <laughs> because, see, we grew up listening to Max because my friend Billy Drummond, yeah. great jazz drummer, lived around the corner from me. Oh, and so we used God. to listen to records and stuff. And so I was like, Max Roach, man? So I had a friend, Rob Magaha, a trumpet player that played with Max. So he got me Max contact. I called Max Roach up and Max answered the phone. <laughs> and he was like, this, you know, and, and basically long story. So I said, Max, man, you just don't know, man. It's like, you are a hero, man. Yeah. Just this melody stuff, man. We just, you know, just what you guys did with the drums. He said, man, you my hero, right? I said, well, man, when did you see us play? What? What what makes you yeah. even know what I'm doing, man? <laughs> and he said, man, he came to a show that we did, and he said he heard these drums. He said he knew it was live, but he didn't hear to see the drummer. And then he pointed to the guy on this weird-looking guitar, <laughs> and he said, when I saw that, I said, God damn, that's some creative. And I'm like, I'm on the phone going, this is Max Roach, right? So you have to remember, I'm still in my invisible phase. I'm just trying to be invisible. Yeah. I'm not looking for praise, criticism, whatever. It's all imposters, man. I'm just trying to get it done. And I'm not looking for a lot of interviews and stuff. I just want to play the drums and find my way. But here's Max Roach on the phone. And I'm going, man, there's my award right there. Man, was Max was so Max deep Roach. at so many levels. I had the chance to hang out with him many times. Yeah. Such a deep, deep person. Yeah. I interviewed uh, Chick Corea recently, and Chick was talking about how he Drummer. played... Chick was a fantastic drummer, yes. and Chick was talking about how he had performed with Max on the same stage, and Max had gone on before him, yeah. and would talk about certain tunes, yeah. drum solo performance, yeah. and then play the tunes. Yeah. And Chick said, you knew exactly the tune, you knew exactly the form, yes. you knew exactly what it was doing, the solos, coming back to the melody, yeah. taking, taking it out. It was so crystal clear as the solo drummer playing the melody and performing this yeah. musical composition, he said it was just so inspired. Yeah. So Max was something special. So yes. for Max to give you that kind of acknowledgement, this is deeper than deep yeah. in yeah. the process. Yeah. Here you are now, you're learning all this stuff, you're creating all this, you're inventing, you're at this incredible stage. What's next? What's the next step? Well, again, a part of it is like when I say I see the drum set as a piano yeah. and the piano as a drum set. Yeah. If we think about the piano, a piano is an instrument where operas and all parts of the music emanate from this 
instrument that yeah. seemed melodically and harmony, but it's it's a percussion thing. Yeah. So I'm seeing the drum is plugged into that. When I'm starting to apply all of this, just automatically symphonic works are coming out. Right. Because I'm not even limited to drum sounds now. I can play string sounds. See what I'm saying? Yeah. So these orchestral pieces are coming out. And I feel like, wow, I'm sort of tapping into where Tony was leaving off, where he was studying orchestration and stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And he was introducing Miles to all this orchestral works, you know? And I feel like I'm sort of slipping into another phase where it's a bigger picture. So I have like these orchestral works and, uh, and then I've uh, worked on scripts and storyline. Like they're like modern day operas, yeah. which is like modern day films that are coming off of that. But it's because I'm anchoring it in the drums as that pianoistic type of instrument that's carrying the whole history of the music with us. Mm -hmm. You know, because in the beginning was some kind of rhythm, your heartbeat, some kind of frequency was the word. Yeah. And out of that speeded up version of that rhythm, we get the notes and the pitches and stuff. So I'm like, I feel like I'm just anchoring it down and the possibilities of this instrument are revealing itself Beautiful. to me. See what I'm saying? Beautiful. And I'm moving in multiple Beautiful. directions at once because as I move forward with the technology, I'm also moving backwards this way. So with the acoustic drums, I've always felt the most valuable real estate on the drum set that I'm trying to reach is that bass drum, basically the other side of the drum head. Right, right. I'm just, man, if I can just get <laughs> to that, you know? And so um, I met the Sliceman drum people. I got the chance to meet, talk to Don Sliceman. Don is, a, again, based in Australia, yes. very creative, ingenious yes. drum manufacturer. Yeah, and the way he thought about the instrument was so much respect. Yeah. I was like, wow, yeah. here's a guy. Have you heard his drums? Yeah, I, I play them. That's what you play? Yeah. Unbelievable yeah. sounding drums. Right, here's the only uh, drum set that doesn't drill into the shell to tighten free it. Free floating. Yes. Yes. Beautiful. Right. So, with the Sliceman drums, uh, the guy uh, in town that distributes them, Mother Tone distributes them, Michael Turner. Nice. So I, I tried the bass drum panels and I really liked them because I don't really play bass drum, but I could play double bass like yeah. here. I was like, cool. But so his pedals are different designs. Yes. It's the pedals are on the outside. Yeah. And, and the they beat is on the, the inside. Bass drum. Yeah. Beautiful. Right. But they told me a story when Buddy Rich came to Australia. I heard about these bass drum pedals. This is like Buddy Rich called and wants to see the pedals. So everybody's <laughs> like, oh. And they said Buddy Rich got on those pedals and did with his feet what he does with his hands. Yeah. That's what, but because Buddy Rich was a tap dancer too. Absolutely. And I was days, like, yeah. man, did y'all record that? They yeah, were like, that no, there imagine. was only maybe Buddy, him, and somebody else. Three people <laughs> saw it. But the imagination of that didn't yeah. leave me. And Buddy Rich said, this right here is good, but but my drums are all nailed down. Yeah. I'm an old dog, you know what I mean? I'm, yeah. I'm not going to do new tricks. This is this is for the future. You know who carries those Sleshman pedals around with him is Will, Will Calhoun. Will Calhoun. Will takes them with him. I've done many clinic tours with Will. He brings them, he takes them out of his case. Yeah. He uses them, and of course, Will is a brilliant yes. player. Yes. Jazz, bebop, funk. Yes. He, Will has you know, the Latin influence, world drumming. He's got it all covered. Yes. And how he utilizes electronics those pedals, and everything. Electronics. So you're playing the drums, so you're still doing acoustic stuff. Right. On top of everything. So on top of the acoustic, the long story where I was going is yeah. because I, the pedals are so nice, I revealed to Michael something I've always wanted to do. He said, man, I always want to get the bass drum up. Yeah. I always want to get it up so I can hit it with my hands yeah. and hit it with the feet. Yeah. And now I got the right pedals. And so he just rearranged the pedals. Instead of uh, beating They're forward, up. they beat up. Right. And the double pedals beat up. So I got two feet on the bottom and I got my hands on the top. That's where we started. So now. you're reconfiguring the entire drum set. Yeah, we're just looking at it again, man, right? So now that turns the bass drum into the same thing the snare drum is. <laughs> the snare drum is like the white hole, the bass drum is the black hole. And we're just hitting the toroid from both sides. <laughs> you know, like you can place approach the bass drum like a tabla, man. Absolutely. Right? So then we didn't leave it from there, right? So we're pushing, right? We're, we're really stirring up trouble. I was like, I, I came to start trouble here, man. <laughs> <laughs> so the drums got to have a breathing hole in it anyway. And I said, Michael, I joked when I first said, I said, man, well, we need to cut a, a F hole in there. You know, just like a violin or, or cellos and violas and yeah. stuff. There, there's a reason for the F holes. And I went home, you know, I just kind of joke. But at, that night I thought about it. And the next day I called Michael saying, wait a minute, Michael, 
this is a serious idea. We need to like do this. And he was already cutting the holes. <laughs> right? So now in all of my drums, I have these F holes. Like a violin. Like so a violin. The, the, so how the air is is released from the violin, yes. that cutout yes. produces a certain sound. So you're right. now bringing that to the drum set. Right. Huge. This is, this is like, this is kind of radical. We're going to cut yeah. into Sliceman's drums. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Who already doesn't cut in the drums. And we're going <laughs> to cut into them to try something? <laughs> I must think that I see something, right? <laughs> so sure enough, man, we cut those breathing holes in it. And it wasn't just breathing holes. They were miking holes. Mm. You can place the mic on them. Yeah. So I'm looking how all my violin and cello players, how where they place the mic. They don't place it right on the hole. They place it off of the hole. Right. So now we have the opportunity to mic the toms, not just from the top or the bottom, but from the hole. And we can mic from the hole and the top, Beautiful. or the hole and the bottom. And it yeah. creates, engineers have messed with the phase distortion to get the panning to go wide, but we, we, we slipped onto something that's elegant and it's beautiful and to me, it's fundamental. It's just as fundamental as taking the low boy where the hi-hat used to be low. Yeah. And somebody said, well, let's raise it up so we can click it with our feet right. and we can hit it with the hands. Right. So now we can hit that bass drum with the foot and we got the full access with all the mama, daddy, all the combinations. And I'm just waiting for the future to get a hold of that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Just imagine with the Virgil Donalis and, oh, and the crazy is, people. Who's is. the guy that I just mentioned? The knower. Yeah, absolutely. People like that yeah. on this thing. And I say that because sometimes people look at the state of their instrument and you don't feel hope or something. But when I look at the drummers out there right now, these people like the Ronald Bruners and yeah. the uh, Thomas Pridgens and yeah. the... This guy that I just talked about with the group, Noah. Yeah, yeah. Man, they are taking the drums and they're, they're going at it with this thing that I see Tony Williams. He's got so much intent. And then Billy Cobham came with that yeah. and just kept it going. It's like Dr. J to Michael Jordan. We just keep this thing going. <laughs> it's a and, different intent. Yeah, but yeah. now when you approach the drums, that, and that bar is just there by default. Right. Just like if you play basketball, the Michael Jordan bar is there whether you like it or not. Absolutely. The game, you know, when you see LeBron and Kobe and everyone's trying to measure up to that bar. Well, Billy Common to me set that modern bar after Tony Williams and after Buddy Rich. He set a bar that was just so high it could produce somebody like a Dennis Chambers yeah. or a Carter Beaufort. Absolutely. Will, I mean, everybody would not be playing the instrument the way we play it. We would not be thinking about it if it wasn't for Billy Cobham. And at almost 75 years young, he is still raising the bar. Yes. He's still pushing it. Yes, it's yeah. Absolutely and so amazing. that's inspiring. Yeah. Because the thing about music that's inspiring is of, of the art forms, if you play sports, your window is very short. Yeah. You're yeah. gonna be here and then your career yeah. is gonna be over. Music, but it's music long is term. the lifetime. Long term, absolutely. It's long term, yeah, man. Yeah, and you can yeah. just keep growing. Look at the Rolling Stones. <laughs> you know what I mean? Still going strong. Still going, Still going strong. strong. This man, Mick Jagger, staying in shape. Yeah. He's running up and down those big stages. That's a testament to the power of this art of music where if you apply yourself, you do not have to stop. You but it's a testament going. to the power of what you're doing, Roy, the fact yeah. that you are still pursuing this. You know, this young generation that watches this, they look at this here, they see someone like self that's so influenced by what you're doing. Yeah. And, and I use the word carefully when I use the word genius, and, I, and I'm serious to say this here. Mm -hmm. you, are, you have those elements of genius in you as a player, as a creator, as just a, a visionary at such a highest level to bring music well, and our instrument of drum set, yeah. well into the 21st century. Yeah. That's really what you're working on. Yeah. What would you say in closing? Yeah. What would you say to this next generation on how they can pursue their dreams with their love and passion for music? First of all, I would say that to move forward a lot of times, you want to ground your idea into something. Because a lot of times you've got an idea but your idea is like in space, right? If I want to build a skyscraper, I can draw it in space, but I got to anchor it to the ground. Yeah. And a lot of times you want to anchor what you're doing. So it's like my mom talked about a blueprint. You know, she talked about like a, a seed for an oak tree. Who would think that a big oak tree could come out of that? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. But that oak tree is grounded in the earth, yeah. right? And in the right conditions of the rain and the sun and it builds roots, it's going down first. Yeah. Just because you got to have roots. The higher you get, the deeper your roots got to go to stand up. So you want to believe in your ideas, but you want to try to ground them in something that came before you. 
Something that came before you is showing you how you ground your ideas. Yeah. That's why I talk about Tony and Mac. I could not try to do what I'm trying to do if it wasn't for who came before me. Standing on the shoulders of giants. Yeah, and this is literal, man. Yeah. It's literal in science. So you want to do that, but then also you got to ground yourself in their courage, too. Your idea a lot of times is going to be a risk. You're taking a risk, especially if you try to add something to the game or you try to execute something in a different way that it hasn't been executed before. Yeah. It's going to be a risk. There might, the market might not be there, right? But a lot of times I just say you got to stick to your courage, man. It takes courage, man, because a lot of times a lot of good ideas are just reduced by fear. They've <laughs> never even tried because fear just relegated you back in line to not even try to do what you did. Like to, for me to try to play drums like this, man, it was so easy to just do what you know how to do. I Just do what you know how to do, man. Yeah, yeah. But I'm, I'm experimenting. You know, it's not life and death. I'm just, I'm experimenting on how to move what I see Tony and them doing. How can I move this in a super personal way that plugs me into the melody again? Basically, I'm to plugs me back into hand drumming mm -hmm. in a modern sense, yeah. right? Hand drumming, the way people play drums all around the world with the understanding of sticks and the battery of, of the, uh, the sticks with the, uh, the drum set applying all the limbs to the yeah. sticks. Yeah. See what I'm saying? Absolutely. So with young people, I would just say, man, people are already on the right track, but it's like your courage and your discipline. There's a thing in history where the greater the art, the greater the danger surrounding that art. So I like to say a lot of times all art is surrounded by danger. Mm. If we say Coltrane, Miles Davis, Duke Ellington, the times was not okay in the United States for them. <laughs> yeah. See what I mean? But you wouldn't yeah. know it by the music so much. Yeah. Duke Ellington is so elegant, you don't know that he can't ride the bus. Yeah. He can't get on the bus without a problem. <laughs> yeah. When they go stop to eat, they got to go eat around the side because everything's not okay. Mm -hmm. But look at the music. Yeah. So sometimes you want to use the pressure of your times. You know what I mean? To let it generate the diamonds that are trying to form in you. Right. And that's what I say. Don't let the times make you soft. Because sometimes we got so much technology. You go in the studio, you got auto-tune, you got all this magic. But you might not want to use it every time. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because I, there's a line in the movie Avatar where the general says, uh, this light gravity makes you soft. So he keeps working out. That kind of sticks in my mind. So we want to think in terms of what went before. So if you're gonna, like engineers and stuff out there, you're gonna make a great record, a lot of times you're gonna reduce your use of technology and internalize it. What comes to mind is auto-tune. A lot of singers, you can hear it on the record where they're using auto-tune to fulfill the, the run. I right. hear it in a lot of country music, soul music, but I say even in our time, you can't hear people singing like Aretha Franklin. Yeah. Al Green, yeah. Curtis Mayfeld, James Brown, all these great singers. I just even heard all Hall of Notes. And he's hitting all the stuff. It's not auto tune hitting it for him. And you can feel that. So a lot of times I'm just getting young people, I hear you using the auto tune, but I think you should go for it. Yeah. Sing it so that we can feel it and that you'll feel it too. And so as the as the generation moves forward. I would just say, man, the sky is not even the limit, man, because you're building on something. It's kind of like the guy who ran the first five-minute mile, Bannister. He just recently passed away. Yeah. It used to be you couldn't run a mile and break the five-minute barrier, and then he did it. And as soon as he did it, he just paved the way. Other people are doing it. So everybody that I'm talking about, the Billy Cobhams and stuff, you can just learn to appreciate them to strengthen where you're going now. And I've just, I have so much appreciation for what people are doing on the drum set. You know, we talked about Omar teaching at yeah, Berkeley, yeah. you know, Will Kennedy, all these, Will Calhoun, all of these great drummers. Great, great, great players. We talked about Noah. This yes. guy I just saw, I saw, just saw Jojo Mayer. <laughs> the drums is in good hands, man. <laughs> it, it you know sure what I mean? Is. And so I'm just inspired by what's going on and just to keep moving forward, man, just keep planting your roots because you're gonna plant to take off. You're going to yeah. plant like that. You're going to build a skyscraper. The higher you go, the deeper your roots got to go in order so you don't fall over when you get up there. And just take that spirit and let it cultivate your courage and also your character. Mm -hmm. Because some of my favorite drummers right now, I feel like they don't understand that they're a representative of an art that's so powerful. 
And if you fall at such a young age, you know, only because, not because you couldn't play, but because you didn't know how to carry yourself. Right. You know what I mean? It's just something in your head that's not able to take the praise, not able to handle your own greatness, to really handle your greatness, man, because the whole world is listening to you and the world is listening to you after you're gone. Absolutely. And I hear drummers playing at that level. And um, sometimes I see a character issue where they're just shooting themselves in the foot yeah. for no reason. You know what I mean? I, I just hate that. So to really cultivate your vision, man, cultivate your vision. You know, plan your work and work your plan. Fantastic, fantastic. You well, know? you have found the balance of science and art. Yeah. And you have absolutely been an example of that courage and that intent. You yeah. continue to do it. Yeah. And it's always magic when I'm in your presence. So yeah. I thank you so much, Roy. On behalf of the sessions, you have done fantastic. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you. You see my notes from yesterday. <laughs> I see it, man. Fantastic. Boom, they're double-sided. So thank, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, guys. <laughs>